Translation is the second and final step in a gene becoming a protein. In the first step, transcription, a, a molecule of messenger RNA is produced by RNA polymerase. In the second step, translation, that messenger RNA is going to be converted into a protein product by the ribosome. And that's what we're talking about in this video. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about translation. Translation is the second and final step in the conversion of a gene into a protein. The first step is, of course, transcription. That happens through the activity of the enzyme RNA polymerase. We have a video on transcription. If you haven't watched it yet, please stop now. You'll want to go back and watch uh, the video about transcription before you talk about translation so that you're not lost. So translation happens uh, when a molecule of messenger RNA, which is produced through the transcription process, is translated into a protein by the ribosome. So how does this happen? Well, first let's talk about when it happens. So in prokaryotes, uh, because they lack a nucleus and because their messenger RNAs are already mature to begin with, translation can begin even as transcription is st still occurring. So it's not uncommon to see in bacterial cells, for example, um, lots of different ribosomes already beginning to translate the messenger RNA before the transcriptional process is even done. Again, this is possible because there is no nucleus uh, in, in prokaryotic cells and their messenger RNAs are already mature enough to be, to be translated. In eukaryotes, it's slightly different for a couple of reasons. First off, their mRNAs need to be processed. They need to get a five prime cap, they need to get a three prime poly A tail, and the introns need to be spliced out. And furthermore, that mRNA need, that needs to be secreted from the nucleus because ribosomes uh, in eukaryotic cells are found in the cytoplasm and also in the rough ER. We'll talk a bit about that in just a little bit. But now let's talk about what the structure of the ribosome is. Ribosomes, although superficially similar between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, do have substantial differences. So for example, when we look at the prokaryotic ribosome, we will see that it is a 70S ribosome. It is slightly smaller. It has a 30S small ribosomal subunit and a 50S large ribosomal subunit, both of which need to come together to form a 70S ribosome. Don't get hung up in the math. S stands for Svedberg units, and it has to do with uh, their density, uh, it, basically. So don't worry that 30 or that that the math doesn't add up. That um, yeah, that 30 plus 50 doesn't equal 70. That's fine. If we look at the eukaryotic ribosome, they have a 40S small ribosomal subunit and a 60S large ribosomal subunit that come together to form an 80S uh, ribosome. Um, so you can see that they're, they are slightly bigger, but also contain different RNAs and different, and different proteins as well. Nevertheless, they function basically the same. In order to have a functioning ribosome complex, you need to have both a small and a ribosomal subunit, and the process of translation is remarkably conserved. The one thing I like to bring up about the differences between the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic ribosomes is those differences are exploited quite often um, by drug developers because uh, specifically uh, poisoning bacterial ribosomes is possible due to those differences between the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic ribosome and antibiotics are known to exploit this. So for example, uh, antibiotics like erythromycin and tetracycline specifically target bacterial ribosomes um, but without harming eukaryotic ribosomes, which means they're incredibly effective, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics against, that can work against uh, a broad range of bacterial infections. So now that we've discussed what the ribosomes look like and the differences, let's talk about how they actually function. So uh, the ribosome, the first step in getting translation to happen is ribosomal assembly. Ribosome assembly is slightly different uh, in terms of um, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I won't get too bogged down in the details. Bottom line is this. Assembly begins this way. You have a small ribosomal subunit, and in that small ribosomal subunit, you have a charged methionine TNA, tRNA. So tRNA met is already attached to the small ribosomal subunit. And we'll talk in a little bit why it'll become clear why it's always a methionine tRNA that's in the small ribosomal subunit. That small ribosomal subunit will then find a messenger RNA that is ready to be translated and it will land and attach at the translational start site. At that point, you will have the large ribosomal subunit will uh, be recruited to form the uh, whole ribosome complex. Kind of looks like a hamburger bun with uh, the messenger RNA serving as a 
hamburger. Now, in order to understand how translation works, we need to discuss something called the genetic code. And I did use the article the as in the genetic code because it is the genetic code that is found and works in all living things. There is only one genetic code, uh, which means all life operates to, to translate their nucleotide information into protein information the same exact way. It's the same codons, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. So one of the early puzzles, once it was discovered that DNA is in fact the genetic information that is passed from one generation to the next, was how does a four-letter language actually encode enough information to make the limitless possible number of proteins that can be produced by, limit, by living things? There just doesn't seem to be enough diversity there. Now, it was made simpler to understand this by acknowledging that proteins are simply polymers of 20 different common amino acids. So you don't necessarily have to have genetic, enough genetic information or enough diversity to encode all the different proteins. You just have to be able to encode the 20 different amino acids that could be arranged in combination to produce a protein. So how then does a four letter language of A's, C's, G's, and T's, the nucleic acid language, translate into the amino acid language of proteins with 20 different amino acids? Well, it can't be a one-to-one -one relationship, right? It can't be as simple as A's encode for this amino acid and G's encode this amino acid. It won't work that way. There's only four nucleotides, four different nucleotides, you'd only have four different amino acids. It also can't be a two letter code. And the reason why is simply four squared only equals 16. So if you have four possible combinations here, four possible combinations here, um, it still won't work. There's not enough diversity in a two letter language in order to be able to encode 20 different amino acids. But if we read it in triplicate, now there's a potential to have 64 different possibilities. And in fact, that is how the nucleotide or the nucleic acid language is decoded into the amino acid language. It's, it's decoded in three nucleotide chunks that we refer to as codons. So if you look at this codon chart I show you here, you can see that there's actually an overabundance, right? There's 64 possible codons, but there's only 20 different amino acids. Here's how this works. Each codon can only encode a single amino acid but several amino acids have multiple codons that encode it. Now I know that sounds confusing, so let me back up and disentangle that a little bit. If we look at a codon like GCC, the codon GCC encodes the amino acid alanine, and it will always encode the amino acid alanine. But guess what? GCG also encodes alanine, and GCU encodes alanine, and GCA also encodes alanine. So alanine has four different codons that encode it. Each one of those codons will only ever encode alanine, but alanine has four different potential codons that encode it. And it turns out that indeed 61 of the possible codons do encode amino acids. Now there are three over here, UAA, UAG, and UGA. These three, amino these three codons do not actually encode an amino acid. They are what we refer to as nonsense codons. And what we'll learn is they are the translational stop sequences. When one of these three codons is encountered on an mRNA, it is a signal for the ribosome to stop translation. We'll talk about how that mechanism works in a few minutes. The other one that is very special is the one for methionine, AUG. The codon AUG encodes the amino acid methionine, but it's also the translational start sequence. So remember when I said, when we're assembling the ribosome complex, you are going to have the initiator tRNA sitting inside of the small ribosomal subunit. That is always the tRNA for methionine. Every single protein in all living things, for the most part, begins with the amino acid methionine. It is the universal start codon. And that's gonna become important when we start talking about how mRNAs are translated. So now that we understand uh, how codons work and we understand the fact that there are multiple codons uh, that can encode some amino acids, uh, we can begin to talk about how translation works. By the way, the term for that is called degeneracy. The fact that there are multiple codons for some uh, amino acids is called degeneracy and it's actually protective. We'll do another video on mutations and how they work and we'll see that uh, there, there is a protective effect in some cases uh, of this degeneracy to prevent mutations from having an effect on a protein. Again, we'll talk about that in a separate video. So let's look at the process of translation. So right now, uh, we, we left our ribosome was fully intact, right? We had, um, we had our initiator met tRNA sitting inside of the small ribosomal subunit. We've encoded the large ribosomal, or we've recruited the large ribosomal subunit to form the 
of the whole ribosome complex and we're ready to begin the process of translation. Now, if you could peer inside of that ribosome, there's a couple of things you will already notice. First off, when we look at, uh, we, I said before, there are three different RNAs that are needed to do translation. The first one is that messenger RNA. You need that RNA transcript, that messenger RNA transcript, because that's what's going to encode the information that's going to be decoded by the ribosome. You also need ribosomal RNA or rRNA. Remember, if you look at the ribosome structure, it's like 50% RNA and it's about 50% protein. It's the ribosomal RNA that makes up that, that RNA portion of the ribosome. The other type of RNA that we need in order to decode the messenger RNA is transfer RNA or tRNA. Now, we talked about how we have this initiator tRNA inside of the ribosome. It turns out if you look inside of the ribosome, you will see that there are actually three sites where tRNAs can fit. And they're labeled as the A, the P, and the E site. That initiator tRNA is actually in the P site. And what happens is as that ribosome uh, begins to assemble, it's looking on that messenger RNA uh, so that that tRNA can recognize the translational start site. How does this work? Well, we have to discuss what the structure of a tRNA looks like. tRNA is one of those RNAs that has a three-dimensional structure. It actually uh, base pairs within itself. Again, it's not double-stranded, it's single-stranded, but it can base pair with itself to give it a three-dimensional structure. What's kind of neat is its three-dimensional structure is actually shaped like the letter T, so that's kind of helpful. That's not why we call it tRNA, but it is kind of cool that it is a molecule that looks like we describe it as. Um, and every, every tRNA is gonna have two important sites in there. The first is called the anticodon loop. So the anticodon loop is three nucleotides that are complementary to whatever amino acid or whatever codon it decodes. So for example, if we look at the tRNA for methionine, that initiator tRNA, it is gonna to need to decode the codon AUG. So what is going to be its anticodon? Well, we need to base pair it, right? So AUG, the base pairs then are UAC. So the anticodon loop on all of those methionine tRNAs is UAC. The other thing any charged tRNA is gonna have is the appropriate amino acid attached to it. Because this is a methionine tRNA, it will be charged with an amino acid methionine attached to the end of it. Now, that's what we call a charged tRNA. As they get used, they're going to donate their, um, their amino acid to the, the growing protein chain. They will be released uncharged and they can just go back and get recharged again. So how does the translation process work through the activity of these tRNAs? Well, as I said before, we have three spots. We have the A site, the P site, and the E site. Right now, at the beginning of this process, we have the initiator methionine tRNA sitting in the P site. And what will happen is, basically, that RNA, there's slightly different mechanisms between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. It's not important that we cover these here. But what will happen is that that ribosome will scan using that tRNA to look for the AUG. It'll look for where it can base pair. And that right there is the first amino acid, methionine. So the next thing that needs to happen is that means the first three nucleotides, A, U, G, are the first codon. So what happens then to decode the next amino acid? Well, the next codon must be the next three nucleotides, right? So if nucleotides one through three are A, U, G, let's say that the next two, uh, the next three nucleotides on the mRNA are G, C, C. We use our alanine again. So that means in order to decode that, we need to bring in another tRNA and put it into the A site to decode that GCC, that GCC codon. What will that tRNA look like? Well, it's gonna to have to have the complementary anticodon. The complement for GCC is CGG, so it will have a CGG anticodon loop. What amino acid will be attached to it? Well, it would have to be alanine, right? Because GCC encodes the amino acid alanine. So in comes that tRNA into the A site. But before we talk about that, how did the ribosome actually know that that was the correct tRNA? Short answer is it didn't. The ribosome works through a guess and check mechanism. Basically, thousands of, of tRNAs per second will enter into the A site and it will either base pair if it, or it won't. If it base pairs, then it sticks and it decodes that particular codon. If it's the wrong, if it's mismatched, let's say it's a, uh, a CCC anti-codon loop and it, it, nope, doesn't base pair, kicks it back out and then allows the next one to come in until it gets the right, the right tRNA. It's pretty crazy but ribosomes can do that very quickly, so you don't notice that it's happening that way. So we'll bring in our alanine tRNA into the A site. Um, there's gonna be base pairing between the anticodon loop and the codon, and then what's gonna happen is through the activity of the ribosome, uh, a, a peptide bond will form between the methionine, or the first amino acid, and the alanine, the second amino acid. 
This is actually going to be powered by the hydrolysis of GTP. So we talk a lot about ATP being the energy currency for most things in the cell. When it comes to translation, it's actually GTP that it gets hydrolyzed to power this formation. Remember, this is going to be dehydration synthesis, right? This is an anabolic endergonic reaction because we're building something. We're making a bond. Okay, so there needs to be power applied to make this happen. So now we have the uh, we have the methionine tRNA in the P site. We have the alanine tRNA in the A site. But now we need to decode more codons, right? So let's move everything down one more. Good chunk. Move everything down to one spot. So now we have the methionine tRNA in the E site. We have the alanine tRNA in the P site, and then we're going to bring in a new tRNA into the A site. So let's say that the next codon up is CGA. So now we have this CGA codon, uh, which encodes the amino acid arginine. Let's say that that's now laying kind of underneath the A site. Guess and check mechanism, we're gonna have to bring in a tRNA that has the anti-codon loop that is complementary to it. So CGA, the complement to that is actually GCU. Remember it's U because it is an RNA. You get the base pairing, and now what's gonna happen is a peptide bond will now form between the arginine amino acid um, and attach it to the um, the end of the peptide bond will form between the arginine amino acid and the alanine amino acid, and now our protein is now three uh, amino acids in length. Now we move everything down one more, but uh-oh, we're out of a spot for that initiator tRNA, that methionine tRNA. What happens? It gets ejected. So it leaves the ribosome, it's now uncharged, it will go back, it will get charged with another, uh, another amino acid. Now we have the alanine tRNA in the E site, we have the we have the next tRNA in the P site, and now the A site's open to decode the next, the next codon. And this process will just keep happening over and over again. It's kind of like a like a conveyor belt, basically moving these tRNAs in as the protein is or the messenger RNA is slowly decoded, and that protein chain continues to grow. And this process will keep happening until the the codon that's in the A site is actually one of those stop codons. And what will happen there is the ribosome will stall. It'll keep interviewing amino acids, keep doing the guess and check, but eventually, I'm sorry, the tRNAs, it'll keep guessing and checking for tRNAs, but there won't be one because there is no tRNA that's going to decode one of those stop codons. It doesn't exist. So what happens instead? Well, eventually a release factor will enter into the ribosome. And that release factor will basically pry the small and large ribosomal subunits apart. That will release the messenger RNA, that will release the nascent or new protein to go off and to, to begin functioning as a protein. What often is happening as translation is occurring, as that protein is emerging from the ribosome, it's already beginning to undergo its folding process. So, um, so because of its interactions with water and the and interactions with the amino acid side chains, you're going to get your primary and your secondary and your tertiary folds. Um, that happens in many cases. Other times the proteins need a little bit of help to fold. Uh, that will be done through the activity of chaperone proteins or chaperonins. They can actually come and help proteins fold up. Um, the one thing I would note is if a protein fails to fold, fold properly, that could be the result of poor cell conditions. It could be the result of a mutation that causes it to fold pro properly. If the protein can't reach its finally folded state fairly rapidly, it gets sent to a structure called the proteasome. And you can think of the proteasome as basically a wood chipper. It will break the protein down back into its amino acid uh, monomers. And those amino acids can then just go be placed on the um, onto uncharged tRNAs to to participate in another uh, translation reaction at another ribosome. So we tend not to waste those things. The other option is they could theoretically be broken down and put into uh, the respiration pathway to be used as food, at least in our bodies it could. So the last thing I wanna talk about is where this process is happening. So as I mentioned before, if you are a prokaryote or a prokaryotic cell, there are no cell compartments. So all of this is always going to be happening in the cytoplasm. All the ribosomes in prokaryotic species like bacteria are free ribosomes. They exist in the cytoplasm. Eukaryotic cells also have free ribosomes that exist in the cytoplasm. And in fact, all ribosomes start free. But occasionally, and more than occasionally, quite frequently, uh, some of these ribosomes are going to become bound ribosomes. And they'll be found in the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So how does this happen? Well, it turns out it's the protein itself that's being translated that dictates this process. So what happens when some proteins are translated? In the first few amino acids that get translated, 
uh, they will actually produce something called a signal particle. So this signal particle is a, is a signal that can be recognized by something called a signal recognition particle or an SRP or signal recognition protein, uh, an SRP. And this SRP will actually bind to uh, that little piece of the protein, which will then cause translation to stall. So the ribosome will stop doing translation for the time being. That will then be, the ribosome will then be dragged to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum where it will be bound. Once the ribosome is now docked with the, with the endoplasmic reticulum, it will begin the process of the translation again. And what will happen is the resulting protein will then be deposited into the lumen or the inside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is going to happen uh, for proteins that need to end up in an intracellular compartment need to end up in a membrane, need to be secreted, or undergo something called post-translational modification. So post-translational modifications are the addition of either functional groups or um, small molecules to a protein. Um, this helps to dictate its function, um, dictate its stability, for example. Um, some of these are reversible, some of them are irreversible, um, but many proteins get these post-translational modifications to help them make sure they go to the right part of the cell uh, to make sure that they're functioning when they're supposed to or not functioning when they're not supposed to uh, or to control how and when they get activated. So post-translational modifications are something we'll talk about in another video, but this is where it's going to happen. Um, that newly produced protein uh, that is produced uh, it, by the bound ribosome can then either be secreted from the rough ER uh, in a vesicle to go to its final destination or get modified in some way, or it will more commonly uh, be packed into a vesicle and shipped off to the Golgi, uh, where it will go undergo further processing and then be sent to its final destination. So that's the story of bound ribosomes and how they're different from the free ribosomes. Remember, all ribosomes begin free, and they only become docked at the rough ER when the protein that's being produced sort of gives off this signal that, hey, I'm going to need to go somewhere else once I'm done, so please take me to the rough ER to be processed appropriately. So that's it. That's the story of translation, the second and final step in converting genetic information in the form of DNA into a protein product. Make sure you watch this along with the transcription video that, uh, that I also have up on, on YouTube. Uh, these together will tell you the story of how genes become proteins. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot today and I look forward to seeing you again soon.